Billy, fancy meeting you here. Right. Is that you? Off to Argentina, are you? Beautiful place I hear. Mind if we have a little chat first. Plenty of time to catch your plane. I've done nothing wrong to you, Brian. That I swear to you. Whatever this is, we can figure this out. Don't mind the gun, Billy. It's mostly for effect. Bang, bang, bang! <laughs> no, no. I'm just holding it in the unlikely event that I may have to kill you. Nice for you, isn't it? Hasn't changed in, what, 22, 23 years? Poshest thing I ever saw. Couldn't believe it when you put me up here then. Who was I? Some young American writer with my new book under my arm wearing the only suit I had. You had a lot of faith in me, Billy, and I'll always be grateful for that. Uh, I feel dizzy. I thought I That's right, Billy. I'll shoot your pecker off. You'd be up in the flash up and about the room. Do you really hate me that much? Hint you, Billy. If anything, Billy, I've always been worried about you, about your health and well-being. And all of us who were dependent on you were always concerned. After all, if something were to happen to you, who would be there to manage our finances? Brian, this is not the first time I've seen you having delusions. How many other times have I seen you in the state? How much more whiskey do you have to drink until you're permanently damaged? What's left of your brains and your talent? See me like what, Billy? Drunk, mad, whimsical, with a load of gun preparing to blow an east of us tunnel through your head? The answer to that, Billy, is never. How much more whiskey do I have to drink before I permanently damage what's left of my brains and talent? That's easy, Billy. My talent is beyond damage. I didn't destroy it. I used it up. It doesn't keep filling the banks of my mind like the river now every spring. It cracks under searing pressure of critics and readers who demand art, enormous popularity, and high standards all at the same time. I did, however, write eight wonderful books before the drought set in. And those eight books, those film stills, those television rights, they made a lot of money, didn't they? Enough to secure the future of myself, my two ex-wives, my children, and my grandchildren. Until yesterday, about noon, when I found out quite innocently and by chance that there is no money, that there's nothing left of what I put away. In other words, Billy, I'm broke, and in some small measure, it pisses me off. Yes, well, I can see why you would be, but let's just talk facts here for a moment, can't we? That would be helpful. <laughs> Shed some light on it, so to speak, eh, Billy? Perhaps you can explain to me how every penny I worked a lifetime for, saved and invested by my longtime friend, Billy Fox, advisor and manager, has all suddenly Gone. Vanished. Departed to places and pockets unknown. What would cause such a strange thing like that to happen, Billy? Well, you must understand that these losses are only paper losses. Paper losses, are they? Money is printed on paper, isn't it? And my bank accounts are also printed on paper. And on those papers, it is said that my total worth now is eight zeros with no number in front of it. Is that what you mean, Billy? Brian, may I suggest that if you put down the gun, this could be more of a, a conversation than a life-threatening situation, don't you think? I agree. I see your point. Oh, yes. There. Now, it's a conversation. And if it doesn't go well, we can always go back to the life-threatening situation. Go on, Billy. Well... In the first place, what makes you think your money is... Now you see, that's a life question. question. <laughs> but I'll tell you anyway. In my mail yesterday, I noticed a bill from the local butcher. Ordinarily, I send all bills to you and forget about them. But this had last notice stamped on the envelope. Surprised and curious, I opened it. It was cordial, friendly, said that they always enjoyed my patronage and hoped that I was satisfied with their service. However... They said you are four months behind in your payments, and they were left with the reluctant choice of handling such collection of debts over to their lawyers. Is that it? How impertinent of them. All you ought to do is ring me on my private number. So I rang you on your private number. There was no answer. Ah, oh, well, you could have texted me on my mobile. So I texted you on your mobile. <laughs> your mobile never returns my text. 
could be my mobile. Did you at least try my car phone? Eight times. You never were in your car. Right. Uh, the car is in the shop. Repairs, you know? Right. I was gonna send smoke signals, but I thought it'd be a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, now I know. Uh, yesterday I was at City Bank International, on behalf of a large German consortium. Wait, you could have asked Mr. Shepard. He handles your daily cash accounts. So I asked Mr. Shepard, who handles my daily cash accounts. Your accounts in Mr. Shepard. That account was closed a week ago by Mr. Fox. My entire account, I asked. Of course, signed by both you and Mr. Fox. That is what you wanted, wasn't it? Yes, I said, with my knees buckling and my blood pumping everywhere except to my heart. Yes, I, I put your money in a foreign investment fund, explicitly for things like the East German Consortium. So you forged my name? I have power of attorney. I didn't want you missing out on this incredible opportunity. So is my money invested in the German Consortium? Yes. It will be. Will be. It will be as soon as I receive the letter of confirmation. So is my money here, Billy? Or is it there? Or is it, as we speak, flying first class on Lufthansa Airlines, munching pretzels and nuts? Brian, I think there's a misunderstanding. If you were just looking through the portfolio... Last night, I looked for my portfolio. <laughs> I never remember where I put it. There are two things in the world I don't read, Billy. My old books and my portfolio. I don't read my old books because I'm no longer emotionally attached to them. And I don't read my portfolio because I never had an emotional attachment to money. I just have no mind for business, you see. Well, that's what you pay me for. No one really has a mind for business, you see. It took the ancient Egyptians 200 years to build three pyramids, but in 5,000 years, they still haven't paid them off. You haven't put me in that one, have you, Bill? All I want is for you to be able to sleep well at night. That's why we have our four meetings, isn't it? Four times a year, we meet in your office, Bill. With charts, graphs, computers, balance sheets, partnership agreements, etc. And you would explain the meaning of all this to me, spewing out some technical information and some fuzzy, blurry financial terminology that not even the exchequer of England could understand. When you said, Do you understand what I'm saying? I said, Yes. Because the only thing I understood what you were saying was, Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't understand, Billy. I never will understand. I never want to understand. And even if I understood, I would hate myself for understanding. It's not my business. It's yours. My business is to write books. Your business is to take my business and turn it into things that profit both of our businesses. My liability is that I have to put all my trust into you. Your responsibility is to honor that trust. Somewhere there's been a breach on that trust, Billy, which is why I'm holding the breach of the stone, drawing closer and closer to the moment of your demise, extinction, and execution. Brian, you've been friends more than 20 years. Doesn't that mean anything to you? I cherish those first 20 years, Billy. It's only the last day and a half you turned into a major shit. <laughs> you stole my money, though, didn't you? No! Swear? You got struck me dead. That's why he sent me. Oh, <laughs> oh Christ, you've taken leave of your senses. Well, you've taken leave of my senses and my pound sterling and my gold certificates. Tell me, Bill, it's a small point, but am I still paying for an empty safety deposit box? What's the use? You have no intention of letting me explain. Go ahead, get over with it. Blow my brains out if it'll make you happy. I didn't say it would make me happy. It would just make me feel less pent up. You stole my money, though, didn't you? No, I... I borrowed it. Oh, I see. It's a loan. I loaned you my life savings. I can't pay my butcher bill because I loaned you every cent I have in the world. I didn't know I was that great of a friend to you, Billy. Well, now, since you didn't tell me, that could technically be considered stealing. Right? Well, in a semantic sort of way, That's semantic bullshit. You stole it. Why? I trusted you, Billy. Why did you do it? Envy, I, I, I suppose. Actually, I'm very good at looking after other people's money, but not my own. You see, I make a great deal of money for my clients, but it's not quite as difficult as you suppose. It's quite easy to increase the wealth of a man who's worth 10 or 20 million pounds. Doors open for him that be 
otherwise close your ordinary investor. It's a private club, you see. The wealthy, I mean. You don't need to join. You don't have any references. Your portfolio is your reference, and your credit rating gets you in. Billions of pounds are moving every day like pawns and knights, queens across a sterling silver chessboard, controlled and managed by the Grand Masters of Finance. The Grand Masters really lose. The power of wealth is very seductive, and I was seduced into thinking that some of the power belonged to me, by virtue of introducing the wealthy to the Grand Masters. After all, if I increase their wealth, their sense of security, their well-being, their style of life in general, did I not have a hand in it? And slowly I began to think I was one of them. I thought it was owed to me. I found myself dressing like them, frequenting the same restaurants as them, picking up their wines, picking up their checks, inviting them to lunch. I started to live beyond my means. A house I can't really afford. A few good paintings to show off the house. A wedding for my daughter. So costly, it looked like it was mounted by the man who put on Miss Saigon. For my 25th anniversary, I took 16 relatives and friends on a private charter cruise throughout the Greek islands. I'm still paying that one off. I started mounting debts and in desperation, I did for myself what I wouldn't do for my clients. I made questionable investments. A play with a big name star that never made it out of Bristol. A film partly financed by two of our rating brothers who withdrew their support mid-production, leaving myself and another dozen dudes to try to recoup our losses. Instead, they multiplied. If any of these become public, I would lose the faith and trust of my clients. I needed two and a half million pounds and quickly without any of these becoming public. So I stole from my clients, with the intention of replacing every pound of it. What I did was wrong, I admit to you, Brian. It was non forgivable to see. But in, if in ten days' time, I haven't returned every single pound you've entrusted to me, you would turn me over to the authorities. I can guarantee publishing will be a harsher punishment than any bullet you fire. Well, well, well. Talk about dilemmas. But you know what hurts, Billy? Really hurts. That I wasn't invited on the Greek cruise. <laughs> you would've been bored stiff. They really want your type of pee. No. I was just the sort who would pay for their sort of vacation. You know what, Billy? I take back trash from those first 20 years. I'm beginning to hate you retroactively, you shit. <laughs> Brian, my dear friend, Brian, what can I say? I feel so ashamed. Yes, I can see that. But I just have one minor question for you. How many of us did you steal from? Half? Ten? Five? How many? Just you? Just me. Just me! Not them? Not the others? None of you five and ten million pound members of you grand master stealing silver and her sanctum money movers? Just me! You want anything worth this piece of treasure, this crud? I don't need a gun to kill you. Why me? Why was I the one you picked? Because you were the only one who didn't ask questions. Do you know why all my other clients are so wealthy, Brian? They pay attention. They ask questions. They could look at their portfolio and know if a digit or a decimal point was in the wrong place. They watch their money like hawks. You never knew where the goddamn nest was. Month after month, I slipped one egg after another from under your wing. You were just begging me to rob you. Don't you see that? The great writer looking down at his nose at the mere mention of money, blinding himself to the responsibility of watching over it. It takes two to steal one. One to take and one to get. Do I have anything left? No. Not even a little count. One you might have forgotten about? No. I got it all. All oh, two million one hundred thousand pounds? Two million six hundred twelve thousand pounds. You didn't even know what you had, did you? My foil grandson can see with you without you knowing. Start started training him already, have you? <laughs> it's getting past your death time. Do you think you get away with this? The bellman saw you. The assistant manager saw you when you gave him my credit card. I'm not trying to get away with anything, Billy. I have no money, no prospect, no talent. I'm as good as dead already. If you give me the chance, I can make your money back. At least hear me out. And how would you do that, Billy? In Buenos Aires. That's where I was going. I had an enormous deal set up. An enormously wealthy business man in Argentina, sponsored by a 51% ownership, belonging to one of my clients. He didn't want to sell. His board did want for me to sell. And asked for my help to intercede. 
I did it. I convinced him it was the right move. There's still some problems to overcome. It would have to be done face to face, you see. No conference calls, no faxes, done face to face. That's why they're sending me to Rim's office. You have this ticket with you. Well, yes. Let me see it. This is a one-way ticket to Argentina. Yes, that's the most important part. Mr. Gardo, that's the Argentinian. Offer that if we were to conclude the deal, he would like for me to fly back with him on his private jet to finalize the deal with my board. I wasn't being frugal for me. I didn't want to buy a return ticket because I wanted to walk into Mr. Degardo's office with full confidence, knowing I could swing the swing the deal. Without that confidence, I could ruin the day, and I refused to let that happen. I see. Sounds very promising, doesn't it? It's more than promising. I know I can deliver. There's only one small point that bothers me. Well, what's that, Brian? I don't believe a word of it. Mr. Degardo is the name of your barber. It was probably the first name you could think of. If they're giving you two million pounds, Billy, this deal must be worth hundreds of millions. Why would they send you, Billy, an economy class? They sent an entire army of corporate lawyers. I mean, I know a thing about business, but I know a bad story when I hear it. I swear on the life of my family, the story is true. I'll tell you why I think it isn't. So when Mr. Shepard told me my entire account was withdrawn, a little bell went off in my head. So at 7 o'clock this morning, I drove within 50 yards of your elegant home and parked in the shadows. At 9.30, you appeared carrying your briefcase. Your wife, Margaret, came to the door and called out something about not being late for dinner because the Fosters were coming over tonight. Unusual thing for a wife to say to a man who's on his way to Argentina that day. Unless, of course, you never told Margaret. I followed you into London. You walked into the Bank of Canada, coming out 30 minutes later, with your briefcase looking a little bit heavier. I followed your car to Heathrow Airport, where you had your bags ticketed, British Airways economy class, to where they are now, probably halfway across two oceans, headed for the Vida Perón Hotel, I imagine. And that is when I made my presence made, with a slight prod of your, in your back with the barrel of my gun. So aside from, don't cry for me, Argentina, what do you have to say for yourself, Bill? Nothing. I have nothing to say. I'm tired of all of I stole from you, and that's that. You're right about the story, of course. You're a poppycock. That's the one area where you were supreme, Brian. Or are... That's whatever you want, really. Don't give a damn. What's in the case, Bill? Whatever I can scrape together, 65,000 pounds. I'll, I'll split it with you. You are a malicious weasel. I know what the case. It's not going to open unless I tell you how to open it. Yes, that's how. <laughs> 70, 80, 90, 100, 200. Billy, you aren't as good with figures as you used to be. There must be almost 300,000 pounds in here. Closer to 500. 500,000 pounds. You keep sinking deeper and deeper into the slime as we go, don't you, Billy? An interesting thing just happened, Billy. As you were telling me your story about Mr. Degado, I was amazed to find how quickly I saw through it. That perhaps my talent isn't quite as dead as I thought. Maybe it's writing so much about England. Living in England, that's all the edges of my creative abilities. That perhaps a change of scenery is what I needed. Billy, I'm going to Argentina with my 500,000 pounds. Give me your passport. You can't use my passport. No, you toad. I'm using my own. You'll be busy here. Doing what? Working your ass off to return the rest of my money. To be sent monthly checks to my children and my grandchildren. And if you skip a single month's payment, a registered letter will be sent to the Inline Revenue Service and the police telling them to examine your books, especially mine. By God, I'm feeling ten years younger now. About the same amount of time you would spend at Dartmoor Prison. I turned out to be a pretty fair businessman, don't you think, Billy? Well, I'm off. Oh, you can have this, by the way. There's nothing in there but blanks. 
<laughs> Pretty much like the expression on your face just now. <laughs> you should have taken me on degree cruise, Billy. 